Hi, everyone. My name's Brendan. I'm a simple N of one from New Zealand. And uh, five years ago, my health was in a pretty bad way. I weighed over 300 pounds. I was chronically inflamed. I was taking medication for chest pain. Moving was hard. Breathing was hard. Living was hard. And then it was later on in that year, 2015, when it was suggested to me for the first time that I consider a low-carb diet. And I was referred to a website called The Real Meal Revolution. Well, 15 months later, I'd lost over 110 pounds, and I've been weight stable ever since. I'd also lost 16 inches from my waist. My chest pain disappeared, my blood work normalized, and I even dropped a shoe size. Now these are all physical accomplishments that obviously I'm proud to be able to celebrate, but beyond just the story of merely what low carb has done for the state of my body, also lies the story of what low carb has done for my state of mind. And that's the story I'd like to share today. So this all happened about a year or so ago now. I remember I was at home just staring out the window, daydreaming really. I was trying to come up with a way of putting into words just how my perception of the world around me has changed since having achieved my weight loss goals. And eventually, I came to the conclusion that those perceptions in and of themselves haven't actually changed that much at all. What has changed though, is that I no longer qualify or rationalize those views of the world around me with views of myself. And what I mean by that is, is this. So like, I've always been able to derive some degree of enjoyment from various experiences in life, but I haven't always been able to fully appreciate the true value of those experiences solely on their own merits. Every time I used to look out the window at home, for example, I might typically be thinking to myself in those moments, say, that's a nice view. But then it usually wouldn't take too much longer for my brain to just snap back to reality and immediately discount the value of having seen that view because it didn't change the fact that I was still fat. So another example, say there's a song on the radio that comes on that you really like, it's one of your favorites, so what might you do? Well, you might turn the radio up, you might start singing, you might even start dancing. Not me though, don't worry. Bit of head banging, maybe, you know. What a great song. But then, once it's over, oh yeah, here I am and still fat. Or say you go out to dinner at a nice restaurant in town one evening and it's one of those places where you get what you pay for. So the food is just awesome, you know. That was such a good meal but I probably shouldn't have eaten it because I'm already fat. Now I'm going to borrow a line now from a certain TV show called uh, Game of Thrones. You might have heard of it. Early on in the show there's a scene where a couple of characters are having a conversation and at one point one of them says to the other that anything you say before the word but doesn't really count. And I don't think I ever really understood just how right he was until now. Because now, I don't think but to myself anymore like I used to. Yes, the world around me seems different somehow, but it's not that the world itself has necessarily changed. It's my overall view of that same world that has changed. Because now, whenever I see, hear, smell, touch or taste something that I like. 
the memory of that experience is allowed to float around freely in my head for longer without these other competing thoughts to bring me back down to earth as quickly as before. In effect, it's as if the net balance of my very thinking has become more positive through an increased absence of those negative thoughts. So now, I can look out the window at home and I can think, that's a nice view. Full stop. What a great song. Full stop. That was such a good meal. Full stop. The glasses through which I view the world are just no longer as dark as they used to be. That filtering of old has gone. If my life could be summed up in the style of a game of rugby, then I think it would be fair to say that my personal first half has been spent playing very much, shall we say, into the wind. And a pretty stiff breeze it sure felt like at times too. But as the saying goes, life begins at 40. And so now at the age of 41, my second 40 is just getting underway. And this time, the wind is at my back. Last year, I was amongst the first class of graduates to complete a certificate in health coaching with Precure, an online health education provider based in New Zealand, led by the Schofields, Professor Grant and Dr. Louise. Thank you guys, love your work. I also have the honour of being an official diet doctor success story, and I remain a subscriber to this day in recognition of their efforts to drive change from the bottom up. Thank you, Andreas and the team. I support the Nutrition Coalition as well in recognition of their efforts to drive change from the top down. That can't be easy. Thank you, Nina. And now of all things, here I stand living the dream at Low Carb Denver, thank you, Rod and Jeff. And yet, to think. To think that None of this could possibly have happened without that fateful first introduction to low carb that I received through the real meal revolution. To Professor Tim Noakes, wherever you are, my sincerest thanks for not just having changed the course of my life, but considering the state that it was once in, five years ago, for quite possibly having saved it. Thank you very much. Hello, my name is Chris and I is an engineer. <laughs> Thirteen months ago, I unexpectedly embarked on a personal journey which started with a seven-day fast upon which I learned about the work of Jason Fung, and that seven-day fast turned into a 30-day fast. Once I was not eating, I had the opportunity to read all the resources provided by Low Carb Down Under and really understand a great deal about metabolism and health. Thirteen months ago, it was inconceivable to me that I would be speaking at an international health conference in front of hundreds of people. A personal journey, anyone who's gone through a personal journey knows there's a lot of strong emotion involved. I'm terrified to be up here today, and that's exactly why I am up here today. Anyone who has changed their life for the better can take a lot of pride and sense of accomplishment. I could talk about objective medical measurements, 
like losing 50 pounds or LDL or CRP or HbA1c or liver function markers, but I won't. I could talk about concepts like OMAD and time-restricted eating and mitochondrial health and the insulin carbohydrate hypothesis, but I won't. I could talk about vanity, like having abs or looking good in a Speedo even being a thing, or a 20-something looking over the counter, smiling at me saying she likes my shirt, but I won't. I could talk about first time in 20-year athletic accomplishments, like running a 5K or hiking a mountain or swimming a thousand yards in the pool or yoga inversions or pull-ups or chin-ups but I won't. I could talk about metabolic superpowers like the ability to go three days fasted and hike a mountain, 3,000 foot mountain, two days in a row and the next day feel perfectly fine as if nothing had happened, or going out on a whim and riding a 50-mile bike ride when I was thinking I was going to go around the block. But I won't talk about that. I could talk about reversing 50 years of dietary habits, bad dietary habits, and replacing them with raw broccoli, beef, butter, avocados, and healthy foods, and feeling good and full all the time, but I won't talk about that. I could talk about friends. I could talk about having gone through my transition, looking my best friend in the eye of 45 years, saying, dude, you're going to die, and guiding him through the same path I took. And watching him lose 50 pounds and buy a mountain bike and spontaneous, spontaneously go back to his college passion of building large sculptures. But I won't talk about that. I could talk about life. Waking up one day, realizing your body is now a sports car not a rusted out clunker and not being afraid of speeding or taking corners hard. But I won't talk about that. I won't talk about those things because they're just about me and they mask something more important. And you've heard them all before. What I will talk about today is giants. Big giants and a small giant. I have stood on the shoulders of giants, and those are all the people who have contributed to this conference over the last five years. Any speaker who has gone out of their way to speak and share their life's work with all of us. And it's because of those giants that I have done what I have done. But in the process, I have also become a giant to my kids, to my future grandkids, to my wife, to my parents, to my friends, and to anyone in this audience who hears one word or one idea that I say and takes action and changes their life based on hearing from the smallest giant in the room. Thank you so much for letting me share my story. My issues began in college, uh, as they do for a lot of people, when stress comes to you and you don't take the time to do things right and you eat junk food, and pounds just come on. 
and in the middle of my college experience, I decided I had to do something about it. Well, I was young. I lost a lot of weight. I lost 58 pounds and kept it off for years. And how did I do it? The way they tell you to do it. I've got to say that. And one reason I've got to say it is because I've seen both sides of the coin. I kept it off for several years until in 1995, I had the worst headache you've ever had. And then I continued getting them. The worst headache you ever had, for those of you that have spinal pain may understand, it's the headache that immobilizes you. You can't move without hurting. If you've had an epidural patch or a spinal tap, you might have experienced this. Um, you might unexpectedly vomit. It, it's, it's very serious. Um, the way I dealt with that problem would be um, that I would just check out and hope it went away. Um, then the weight gain ensued, uh, probably uh, compounding results from inflammation. Um, aside from the fact that, you know, maybe everybody falls off the wagon every once in a while too, so I can't just blame inflammation for the problem. Um, and by 2003, I was guaranteed recognizable as fat. I'll use the F word. And um, I was still exercising, but I wasn't exercising as regularly because I had the interruptions. Um, my doctor put me on Phentermine because he hoped it would help. I could get back to a baseline that, that I could maintain again, but I still had the inflammation. And then in 2008, I finally figured out the cause for the headaches. It was degenerative disc disease. You can't believe how hard it was to figure that out. And uh, I'd been seeing chiropractors all along, and one day the chiropractor says, I want you to get that taken a look at. So um, all the wonderful brain doctors, you know, and neurologists, uh, they couldn't tell me very much. And um, the way they wanted to treat the problem was by giving you cortisone shots in the back of the neck, um, if you need them. Or it's, it's, I was young, you know, I was in my late 20s, early, I was in my early 30s at the time. And so um, that's the, the path we took instead of surgery, because surgery is permanent. And um, I took medical cannabis for the symptoms, and the symptoms were well treated by medical cannabis, but not perfectly. I was still incapacitated for the time I had these headaches. And of course, I continued to gain weight. Um, I tried walking and eating every three hours and eating healthy fruits and grains because that's what I was told to do. Interestingly enough, before that I wasn't eating healthy fruits and grains. I gained weight faster. Then in 2015 I discovered magnesium before I went keto. I accidentally discovered magnesium. It's too long a story to tell here, but fortunately the magnesium, for anybody with degenerative disc disease in here, that cut the pain from a nine down to a five or something like that. I could live life, but I wouldn't get the worst headache you ever had in the middle of the night anymore and need cannabis just to survive the panic and the horrible stress that comes to you for something like that. And of course, the weight gain continued. Then in January of 2016, I had something called a hypertensive crisis. I went in to get one of those cortisone shots, and I'd only had a few of those shots. I didn't want to get a lot of cortisone shots because I understand what hormones, well, what cortisone will do to you, for example. Um, it's not a hormone, I guess. But um, you don't want to take them or they stop working, which sounds familiar to this audience, I'm sure. Um, so I was there to get one of these shots, and they said your blood pressure is alarmingly high. In fact, it's dangerously high, and we're going to suggest that you go next door to the emergency room and get treated. Well, four medications later and four days in uh, uh, intensive care, I returned from the hospital and doubled down on my walking and eating every three hours. Um, and that didn't work. I gained even more weight, which I blamed on all the medications I was taking because I felt even less energy 
immediately after returning home and taking the medications. By the middle of 2018, or roughly two years ago, I was diagnosed diabetic. What I find remarkable about this, and one take home mes message I want to offer is that while I was going through all this trauma, nobody asked, what's your fasting insulin level? Because fasting insulin, if it's high, it relates to all the things you're experiencing. Get your fasting insulin checked. I'd get it checked. It, it's a simple lab. I'd get it checked anytime you have a malady to find out if it has something to do with what's going on. So I took it really seriously. It's a hazard of being an engineer that you get obsessive about things and you research the hell out of them. Started watching YouTube videos and so forth. In fact, I learned more from Dr. YouTube than I ever learned and more got more useful information and ideas for what to do about it than I ever got from the doctors I actually paid. That's dysfunctional medicine. I want to personally thank Dr. Eric Berg, Dr. Ken Berry, Dr. Sten Eckberg, and Thomas DeLauer, and of course, Dr. Jeffrey Gerber, who is now my doctor. Because I had to leave my doctor. And I'll continue to tell you why. The first thing that happened is he made fun of intermittent fasting. He called it pigging out once a day and not eating the rest of the time. When he found out my LDL was high because I made the mistake of fasting too long, I was on an extended lap fast when I came in for my labs and my LDL was very high. It was not very high in terms of some people, but it was maybe 250 or something like that. I don't recall the number. Um, he started talking to me about how bad my numbers were, even though I had already lost something like 75 pounds, and he called me today's poster boy for my weight loss. So the moral of the story is your doctor might have cognitive dissonance. He might not be able to see beyond all your good numbers and look at the LDL and said, you're killing yourself. Now, he didn't say that, but that's what the kind of thing people will tell you. So the last straw was when I had a gallbladder issue. As has been discussed here today, sometimes your bad diet will cause gallbladder issues. And when you start eating healthy again, you start using your gallbladder again. And when you do that, you're going to have a panic attack, possibly. And I did it in the middle of a fast. I decided I didn't want to talk to my doctor anymore. So first, I had the last meeting with him and fired him. And I told him what I didn't like about him. And then I went to Dr. Jeffrey Gerber, and he did an ultrasound, had an ultrasound scan done, and I found out that I didn't have any stones, and so it was safe for me to go through the process of passing the sludge that was apparently in my gallbladder. And uh, so that's my story, and I hope everybody here had an opportunity to learn something from it, because I believe my story is a little bit different from the typical story, even though it was a little bit long. And I'd like you to tell your friends and relatives about low-carb living and what almost literally is a miracle. Thank you. Thank you so much. That's a pretty impressive resume, isn't it? Good, now just forget it, because that's what I do, but it is not who I am. And I want to share with you uh, part of who I am today. So I grew up on Long Island as a, an extremely skinny child. I was so thin that you could see my ribs uh, through, through my skin. And my parents, being the good Long Island Jewish parents that they were, were so worried about me. And it was, Alan, eat, 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 please eat. And so, of course, that's what I did, and I didn't gain a pound. And then when I was 18 years old, I had uh, some, a back problem, and I had back surgery, a spinal fusion. And that was before uh, managed care, so I was in the hospital for two weeks after my surgery. And my activity was minimal to nothing. Um, and um, my diet, uh, which I had never considered because it was never an issue, was basically every day for lunch I would have a a foot-long pastrami hero from Vito's in Hicksville, New York. I still remember how good that tastes. 
every day. And of course, uh, at, at night, I would have spaghetti and meatballs. So at the end of all this, a few months later, my pre-op weight having been 185, uh, I was up in the 220s at, at 18 years of old of age. And so I had a nice beer belly, a nice middle-aged uh, beer belly uh, at the age of 18. And uh, I pretty much kept that until I was about uh, 48 years old. So then I went on, I went to medical school, and I went to, um, uh, did the residency. Um, to take my, make sure I don't miss anything here. Um, and then I joined uh, my practice in Goshen in 1994, and in 1997, um, in our county, there was nobody doing sleep medicine. And in my pulmonary medicine, uh, f fellowship, I did a month in the sleep lab, and I thought it was really fascinating. So uh, when the uh, respiratory department came to our group asking if somebody wanted to start a sleep lab, I said, sure, I'll do it. And we started the first lab in the county, and I educated myself much like I'm doing here in sleep medicine, went to all these different courses, and was fascinated and enjoyed it. And uh, we started the sleep lab, and it did really very well. And of course, most of my patients were overweight or obese, uh, and I would put them on CPAP, and they would feel much better and be very happy with me, and that was, that was terrific. And then uh, fast forward to 2008, and uh, a few things sort of happened at the same time. Uh, one of them, I was just walking towards the sleep lab, and there was this uh, reflective uh, glass on the side, and I looked to the side, and I said, oh, who's that? And it was actually me, and I didn't recognize how big I had gotten. And um, I had a patient who came to see me uh, in the office, as he, he often does. We'll call him Charlie, because, well, that's his name. And um, so Charlie was a volunteer at the hospital, and a real a wise guy, and we always had good fun. And I, first thing he said when I came into the office, he said, Doc, welcome to the Dickie Doo Club. I said, oh, what? Welcome to the Dickie Doo Club. I said, Charlie, what's the Dickie Doo Club? And here he is, this 75-year-old guy who weighed about 300 pounds, sitting down, and he says to me, the Dickie Doo Club, that's when, let's see if I can get it right, that's when your gut sticks out more than your Dickie Doo. <laughs> so I said, okay, I'm starting to get the message. Shortly thereafter, my son has a play date with his friend, and his mother comes to pick him up. And all these things, like, happen at the same time. And, uh, Laura says, Alan, I want to show you something um, that I've been doing. And so we sit down, and she shows me a nice PowerPoint, and it was, a, it was a, a meal replacement plan. And in medical school, my teaching was that you don't worry about um, weight reduction because it's, it's futile. So there's, there's no point in even trying. And so I listened to uh, her presentation. I said, you know, that sounds really encouraging. I'd like to try it myself. And, I, and um, my first thought was like, I could use to lose a, f a few pounds. I said, maybe I'll use 10, lose 10 pounds, see how I feel. And then if I like it, I have so many patients that you know, might benefit from it as well. So I started on it, and in two weeks, in 14 days, I lost 14 pounds, and I had the energy like I had never had before. I felt terrific, and I, I was reborn. I was like a new person. It was basically, I was eating a 90-carb, uh, a 90-gram carb diet. So imagine how many carbs I was eating beforehand, right? And um, so I started, I, I looked at the, the BMI scale, said, well, I'm six foot two, that's how tall I was then. And um, what should my weight be for a healthy BMI? I said, oh, let's get to 185. So basically within two months, I had gone down to 185 pounds. And that was 2008, April, or June was two months. And um, when I left home to come here, I was 189. So I've pretty much maintained for all that time. And I'm so happy about that. And I still continue to feel good. And then I found out there was actually a medical specialty called bariatric medicine back then. It's now called obesity medicine. And I looked into what, you know, can I incorporate this into my practice and become board certified? And there was a way to do that. And I did. And I started seeing, uh, it was 2011 when I finally got the certification done, and I was seeing patients for sleep apnea as well as for uh, weight loss. And seeing my patients lose weight and feeling as good as I did and really changing their lives, it was just so gratifying as a physician to be able to, uh, to help them with that. Um, so yes, I do pulmonary and critical care and sleep medicine, and, and weight loss medicine. So that's, that's, that's a lot of what I'm doing. And uh, 
what I'm looking towards um, doing now is moving my practice away from the pulmonary and the critical care and towards uh, sleep medicine and, and the obesity medicine. And the reason for that is when I see my, when I, when I take care of my sleep and weight management patients, I have such a, a connection with them and I feel like, you know, they came to me with issues and problems and I really helped move them in the direction where they can improve their health as opposed to the pulmonary and critical care, where I think those are important fields, but I never got that sense I was really taking people and, and improving them from a, a root cause way. Um, and my practice, you know, thankfully, is that I get a lot of sleep referrals, and I just, uh, I'll put them on their, on their CPAP, they'll start feeling terrific, and that's when I bring up that I also do weight management. So they're already uh, geared up, and they're, they're, they're already happy with me, and say, you know, whatever you say, doc. So that's, so many of them actually are very enthusiastic about uh, doing the weight loss. And it's been a really nice uh, synergy within that practice. Um, and I've been coming to uh, so many of these conferences all along. I've been to pulmonary and critical care and sleep medicine. And coming to Low Carb Denver, it is so much my favorite conference. Why? Because, why, well, why am I standing up here? I mean, this is crazy. It's a lot easier sitting down there. I'm standing up here because it's just, I feel like such love and passion for the work that I do and my personal journey that I just want to share it with the whole world. And you, my friends, you're the ones that you, you get it and you live the same experience. You know what it's like to be in a nutritional ketosis and how awesome that feels and to share that with others and see them turn their lives around, so, uh, so, so grateful. Um, and so when I say that's what I do, it's not who I am. Uh, who I am is somebody who's so grateful to be part of this community and to, to help spread the word of really what the, the, the right way to create health and maintain it. So thank you. Hi, my name is Pamela Zorn. I live here in Colorado. I have owned a winery downtown for the last five years. We just closed in July. Um, the reason I'm up here is because my story is a little different. I've been fat. I didn't care. It wasn't about weight for me. Um, three years ago, I met Brenda Zorn online in a fermentation group. And she reached out and said, hey, could we be related? And as it turns out, we're not. We did the ancestry thing. But what she did for me is friended me. I was following her Facebook page and somebody mentioned hypoglycemia. And I had been seeing keto, keto, keto and ignoring all of it. And then somebody mentioned hypoglycemia and that it helped them. And so I called Brenda, hey, is this something I can do? I can't fast because of the hypoglycemia. So she said, fasting's not part of this. Just eat this and don't eat that. So I started. Two weeks later, I realized I had not had a low blood sugar in two weeks. A month later, I realized that I had not used my asthma inhaler in a month. So the day I started keto, it cured, and I will say cured, my hypoglycemia and my asthma. I was on asthma medication two times a day, twice two medications. Uh, the hypoglycemia, I would eat, I would spike, I would not eat, I would plunge, and this was my life since I was 17 years old. I was diagnosed at 17, and the only nutrition advice my doctor gave me at the time was eat so six small meals. That's it, that's all she told me. So from the time I was 17 years old, and by the way, I'm 52 now, I would eat, spike, not eat, plunge. And that was my life. And for the first time, I feel good. I feel really good. So if nothing else, the hypoglycemia, not having that saved my life. Because the last blood work I got done before keto, my blood work, I was a 5.6, and uh, she didn't say anything. She didn't say a word about being worried about it. She didn't say anything. So I just got blood work done a few weeks ago, and I'm at a 5 now. 
Um, and the only other thing my doctor told me when I was 17 is keep an eye on those blood count numbers because this can flip. You will be diabetic eventually. And I was. I was almost there. And so keto saved my life completely. Now, to be fair, the weight loss is nice, but it wasn't my goal. I have lost 65 pounds, but it wasn't, that wasn't my goal. It was, I feel good for the first time since I was 17. I could have been a different mom. I could have been a different friend. It was just, I was so sick and didn't realize it until I wasn't anymore. So keto and now fasting, the fasting has been amazing, but I wasn't be, gonna be able to do that while I was hypoglycemic. There's no way I could have done that. I had to eat every three hours or I was dying. And my version of hypoglycemia was my blood sugar would go low and my face would go numb and my wrists would curl in. And if I didn't eat something by then, my kids or my husband had to stuff food in my mouth because I was no longer conscious enough to do that. So that's how bad it was for me. So I haven't had a low blood sugar in over three years. So it's a really, really great way to live now. And I will never, ever go back to garbage because I don't want to be sick like that ever again. So that's my story. Also, my husband has lost 250 pounds on keto. So this is a really, really good way that we should be eating. So that's my story. Thank you. So I want to thank everybody that's here because it's the association of faces to names to histories and everything that you are bringing forth to inform not just me, but all the people that I touch that has dramatically changed my life. And in particular, it's not about my health uh, as, as such, because I lost 75 pounds, I'm energetic because I'm doing Ben Chichio's uh, uh, high intensity resistance training, and I stay in ketosis most of the time. The real dramatic change was when my brother's healthcare provider at assisted living type uh, stage four lung cancer was dying, I had to bring my brother home. He was a Marine, developed schizophrenia while he was San Diego State University studying electrical engineering, smart man. But after three years, his grades started declining and one day he disappeared, it took months. My father and mother found him in an abandoned car. Catatonia, just a different man, 40 years. So when my parents died, I became his guardian 20 years ago. And my mother on her deathbed with pancreatic cancer, which I think many of us would have recognized as the long end stage of metabolic syndrome, she said to me, you cannot take him out of Austin, Texas. He's got to stay with his psychiatrist. They're doing medical trials on him, human trials. And we're eventually going to find the right medications, a cocktail that will cure him. And I'm just a naval officer. I believe that was the answer, and that's what I did. Five years later, we found a cocktail. And of course, what the cocktail did was suppress all his effective reactions, all his emotions, and I was happy for 15 years basically until the crisis came and I had to bring him home. So when I tried to get him in the truck, he, could, he couldn't even fasten his seatbelt. So this man, I got him home, drove him home from Houston. He tried to get in a chair. He weighed 250 pounds. He broke the chair. Bam. Uh, major adaptation on my part to a different thing. The first thing he asked me, even in the depths of his despair, was, can schizophrenia be cured? Well, I couldn't answer him. I didn't have an answer. So I started doing research. That's what we would, would all do, right? I came across Chris Palmer's work. He had reversed the chronic schizophrenia of Doris 
She had been schizophrenia free for four, 13 years. Uh, and this was a very dramatic case because she had tried to commit suicide one time by swallowing bleach. A dramatic change. Of course, my brother was on uh, several psychotropic medicines. And uh, as I said, I'm just a dumb old line officer. And uh, I was going to find the answer. So this is not something I recommend people do on your own because there were a lot of stumbles and scars and scary things. If you can enlist the assistance of other doctors that are more friendly to this idea, a psychiatrist, the general practitioner. I, I have a Christian Assad is, is my brother's um, cardiovascular consultant. I have a psychiatrist. I have a neurologist. I have a general practitioner. And I can't get them all to agree on this. So anyway, at this point, back in January of last year, I took it upon myself to de-prescribe, as Brian Lenski talks about sometimes, to de-prescribe my brother of these medications. I started doing it slowly over six months. At the end of six months, he's off of the medications. He's in ketosis, though. Thanks to Keto Mojo, I could measure his ketones. I had him on a continuous glucose monitor. If I had not read and done some research, I would have been scared out of my wits because there were times when his blood levels went down to 40 milligrams per deciliter. The indications were all red, but he was walking around fine. I'd ask him, how do you feel? I feel, I feel great. I'm going to go for a walk. But his ketones were running four, five, so He's got plenty of energy, more energy than he had when he had all the psychotropic drugs that, that were metabolic disruptors. Took him to the psychiatrist, and basically what we've come to is he's down to one psychotropic medicine, metformin and thyroid medicine. So I put him in assisted living because, as I said, I'm, I'm not a young man, and making sure that the meals were prepared, that he was on track for certain things. It's, it's more that I could do. But the assisted living facility tells me the government dietary guidelines for low carb or diabetes, he can have almost just about anything. I can't assure that he's going to stay in a low carb diet. We can't do anything like that. So, by the time you get old, you become devious. So, I got one of the doctors to write a prescription. Because when a doctor gives a prescription, then a lot of people listen. And the prescription said, all the green vegetables you can eat. Meat, dairy, aged cheeses, bacon, no juices, no sugar, and for breakfast, eggs. So I took it to the same facility that had told me that they couldn't prescribe or proscribe or inscribe anything into my brother's brain or into his habits. And all of a sudden it was like, hey, you've been drinking juice? You've been eating the spaghetti? Now they took charge of making sure that my brother stays on a very low carb, well, a low carbohydrate diet. And he's a different man. Is his schizophrenia cured? Probably not. Can he have cheat days? Let me tell you, the days that he had cheat days, because I naively thought that he could have Thanksgiving. Hey, it's OK. It's Thanksgiving. Disaster. Major psychotic incidents. OK? so. This is not a path to tread upon lightly. Get all the help you can if this is the cause that you're working on. But this lifestyle change for him is dramatic. And I want to thank this entire community for all the support that you've given me and all the education that all of you very bright people have provided us, the lay public, 
Thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Ramon Issa, and you're wondering why I'm up here. So am I, actually, but I, I, know, the, I know the true story. Because I'm here to share the message of hope and healing that each one of us out there uh, can experience. And when the doctor becomes the patient, and the patient needs to get better, they don't follow their own advice. That's how I ended up up here. So I'm a family medicine physician trained at Loma Linda University, a Seventh-day Adventist institution, the same one that Dr. Ted Naiman uh, also went to. And so there's a background of vegetarian and vegan uh, style eating. And so that I had to fight through not only my insulin resistance, I was morbidly obese, I was over 300 pounds, uh, metabolic syndrome, a very painful heartburn, sleep apnea, all those different things. My life was miserable and uh, I, I tried to lose weight the way I would tell my patients. Uh, eat less, move more, calorie count, eat multiple times a day because if you skip a meal your metabolism shuts down and if you don't eat carbs then you'll just chew up all your bones and your muscles and you'll shrivel up into a little bag of fat. That's, I mean that's honestly the things and a calorie was a calorie. Um, it all sounds silly now knowing what I know but the way I ended up getting the results and losing 94 pounds in a hundred days which I know it's unbelievable but sometimes it takes unbelievable things to say I'm gonna prove that wrong and it'll make you figure out what actually happened and until I experienced it myself I wouldn't have believed it and people ask me you know how did you come about did you um, you know watch Jason Fung or learn about or go to diet doctor or read Gary Taubes actually it didn't happen that way when I had to get better my wife would say, go to the doctor, go see your doctor. Your blood pressure is 100 and whatever, 75 over 100. Your triglyceride, your HDL is off. You have heartburn. You're snoring all night. I can't get up in the morning. I said, no, honey, because if I go to the doctor, that's who I was, and I know what I'm going to tell me. And I'm going to tell me you need Lipitor, and you need blood pressure pills, and you need metformin, and you need to exercise, and I don't want to, and you need to get a sleep study because you have sleep apnea, and you're going to wear this machine, and I already know the answer to all those questions. Nobody got better when I did you know, gave that advice, and I'm not going to take the pills or wear the machine. So I'll skip that whole thing. So I said, well, I was actually quite frustrated because I, I said, and I thought about it, while I'm eating and I'm morbidly obese and I'm extremely hungry and I can't stop eating every couple hours, I was, while I'm eating and I'm obese and I feel like crap, I, I, I couldn't believe, I said, why did God or nature create a body that could be 100 pounds of fat but I have to continually eat every two hours. That makes no sense. Why can't I use my own fat for fuel? And then I said, well, what if nature and God aren't stupid? What if the body can use its own fat for fuel? What if? It sounds silly in this room because we all know that we can. Well, I said, I thought about medical school and I think I remembered one thing. Thank God I remember this one thing. And I remembered, I said, I think the body will use fat as a primary fuel only when it runs out of glycogen. But I was like, carbs. I said, I don't know where the carbs are in my food. Does salmon have carbs? Does oil have carbs? Does rice have carbs? I said, I don't know where the carbs are in my food. I don't know how long it takes to run out of it in my body. So I was so fed up because about a month before I actually started this journey, my dad passed away. In front of my own eyes, I was taking care of him at home. And I watched him pass away from the end stage of the things that I had the beginning of. And I saw myself on this train headed exactly to where he was. I'm married, I've got five kids, uh, I'm young, and I thought, there's no way Ramon is gonna live that long. My dad was 72 when he passed away. I was, four, I was around 40 uh, when I started this. And I said, there's no way, I've gotta do something. And so my dad's death, unfortunately, that's what it took to snap me out of this coma. And I said, okay, if the body can get better, if the body can use fat for fuel, it's something I'm eating. There's some, it sounds silly. I thought, I said, there's something I'm putting in my mouth that's either making me sick or keeping my body from healing. And it says, I'm not going to eat until I know what that is. And I didn't know that was called fasting, okay? It was a long story short. That's called fasting, and you can do it nicely and gently. And I did it the, just not knowing anything, so I had all the miserable side effects. But long story short, every day I'd wake up from that decision. My wife would say, are you going to eat today? I said, no. And the next day I woke up, the day two, I'm feeling miserable because I want to eat. My body is like withdrawing from carbs or from whatever because of my insulin resistance. And day three, I felt not as painful and not as hungry. But day four, I was waking up, going to work. I was a medical director and I was putting my suit on. I was like, and I found myself, yeah, I had a little skip in my step and I was whistling 
And I remember thinking, I'm like, this is funny because I got, I said, I got all, I got this energy, but that's funny because I haven't eaten in four days and I feel great. And I thought, the light bulb went on and I said, I'm using my fat for fuel. My cravings were gone. My hunger was gone. I could, it was, eating was an intellectual decision. From that day on, feeling great. And I said, so now I'm going to eat. What am I going to eat? And I thought, well, that's right, the carbohydrate thing. I ran out of carbs. So if I reintroduce carbs today, then my body is going to shut down the fat burning. But I still have like 90 some pounds of fat. So why would I stop my fat burning? So I said, well, I don't know what will happen, but I'll just eat once a day. And I just ate keto, basically one meal a day for the next 100 days, lost 94 pounds. And all my blood pressure, my triglyceride, the metabolic syndrome, I lost well, 16 inches around my waist. And it all, it all got better, feeling the best I'd ever felt. And so when I had to actually learn about this, that's how I ended up finding, you know, there's a method to this. You can do it nicely. You can do it without all the side effects and gently. You can work your way and ease your way um, in, into it. And so the reason why I'm up here now and why I keep coming to these conferences is because if there's the old Dr. Isa, who I didn't you know, know anything about this. I didn't know people could get better because I never saw people reverse diabetes before or reverse metabolic syndrome or get control over their cravings or hunger or lose that kind of weight. Uh, I want to share this with other physicians that are helping their patients. And if you're wondering, why are my patients not getting better? Okay. Or if you're a patient like I was, why am I not better getting better following the advice, uh, you know, from my doctors? There is another option. There is hope. And the option and the hope is that the way your body heals it's already inside of you your body was designed with this program but there's something we're doing and something we're eating that is preventing our body from going through the program of reversing the fatty liver of reversing the weight and all those different things and we just need to find out what that is get yourself a guide a coach uh, read books, you know, the good folks uh, here, low carb Denver, dietdoctor.com, uh, Jason Fong, and the different, and all the different books, Dr. Ted Naiman. These are now the, the people that I share their information with others, other doctors that want to learn, or other um, patients that want to learn more, and you can change lives. So I want to thank you, and I hope this inspires a couple people to do something for themselves, and then maybe also pay it forward and do something for someone else. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you for waiting so long, and I'll, I'll be kind of brief. Um, back in 2015, um, like many people, I was 210 pounds uh, overweight on antidepressants or the biomarkers for metabolic syndrome. And uh, a good friend of mine, Todd White at Dry Farm Wines, he says, you got to kick out those white devils. Cast those white devils out. And I was like, oh, I don't do fad diets, mate. I'm English, you know? Uh, and he goes, but I started looking at all of the science and I started uh, reading up and of all the names that have been mentioned here. And it just seemed to work. So I went on a well-regulated ketogenic diet and I just did keto and yoga and I lost 47 pounds. And it was amazing. I had that joie de vivre that I felt like I was 24 years of age and I could take on the world. And so I did decide to take on the world. In fact, we started a company, and we did pretty well out of it in the ketogenic space. And yet, right from the start, my wife and I, we thought to ourselves, how can we give back on this? How can we give back? And we do about two conferences a month through different, like KetoCon, KetoFest, through Low Carb Denver, Low Carb Universe, other different medical things like the, the Walls Protocol. And we get to speak to doctors and clinicians and researchers all the time. And I constantly hear about funding, that they don't have enough money. They can't do that pilot study. Because who's funding it? Where is the money? Follow the money. Because if you look at the ADA, ADHA, they're getting millions in every single year. There's millions of funding from big ag and from big pharma. But where is the money to be found in food? Where is it? Can the farmer give that up? They can't. And so we decided that, what are we going to do? We're going to go to our grave saying we made a buck, or we're going to go to our grave saying we made a difference, and hopefully that grave is a long, long, long time away. So about a year ago, we set up uh, the Ketogenic Foundation. And it took about a year process to go from a nonprofit to a public charity. 
And I'm very pleased that we partnered for the first time with Fat Fiction, uh, where people can actually donate to hold an event and they can give back. And the goal of the Ketogenic Foundation is to fund clinical trials and studies into the efficacy and use of ketogenic therapies for the benefit of humankind. Because this is ultimately what we want to do. So as I look at it here and I go to all of these different events, and I see all of these different food vendors, be it yogurts, cookies, wonderful chocolates, high triple cream fat yogurts, exogenous ketones in some places, and I think to myself, what if we all gave back? What if we all gave 1% for science? Imagine the pilot studies that we could do. Imagine those beautiful things that we could eventually get good NIH grants. And then imagine the ammunition we could give Nina Teicholtz and Nutrition Coalition to have clear, evidence-based guidelines. This is how we can ultimately change the future of Americans and the globe. Thank you.